Let's get started with a little clip to share the thing. I'm sorry, I'm having a little Zoom trouble tonight, guys. Here we go. How about our opening credits? Welcome to Sherlock Mondays, everyone. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we are going on a biblio venture through the stories of Sherlock Holmes. This is episode 24, The Adventure of the Crooked Man. And joining me as co-host tonight is Anastasia Klimchinskaya. Hi, Anastasia. Hi, so glad to be back. Well, and back for, well, and you'll have a couple shows, but we have seven shows left in our regular run, including tonight. So um, before we know it, we'll be finished. And um, But we have right now just seven more shows of Sherlock Mondays to deduce, decipher, dissect Arthur Conan Doyle's stories about the world's first consulting detective, Sherlock Holmes, and his able assistant, Dr. John Watson, in a kind of conversational annotation. And if you're watching live right now, I invite you to please like and subscribe to the videos and also have fun in the live chat. If you're watching the recording, uh, the same. Please like and uh, like these videos. Subscribe to the Rosenbach's channel. Sherlock Mondays is also an audio podcast. So hello to all of our audio podcast listeners. And I would, of course, ask all of you to please consider making a donation to the Rosenbach. If you've already donated or joined as a member of the Rosenbach, thank you so much. That's really how we get to do this show because of your support for the Rosenbach. So if you've not already donated or become a member, I invite you to do so. And thank you. And soon, later in the show, Anastasia, at the mid-break, I'm going to tell people how they can register for our special subscription-only show on the Hound of the Baskervilles. And we'll talk all about that. That's going to be very exciting to do when this show is finished. And, and you'll be joining me with that, Anastasia. So yep. that will be fun. All right. Well, before we start tonight in uh, in our on our adventure, on our Biblio venture, I would like to tell you what we are drinking or what I'm drinking. Uh, what are you drinking, Anastasia? <laughs> so I'm, you know, I I am of the opinion that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I am, as usual, an old fashioned or rather whiskey sour oh. in my little Sherlock Holmes glass. Um, I believe the drink this week is a warm drink, unless I'm it mistaken. It is. Yeah, it's 70 degrees in Chicago today. It keeps, <laughs> it keeps alternating between... 30 and 70 so my building just cannot keep up with it they turn on the heat and then it's 70 so they turn off the heat but then it's 30 um so right now i'm dying of heat a little and the idea of drinking something hot is uh the last thing i want to do well every episode features a sherlock tale designed by our good friend and co-host mary el cairo you can find the recipes in the YouTube description for the episode, and I also send it out via email. If you are registered for the show, you can register at the Sherlock Mondays homepage on Rosenbeck.org. If you're not already registered, it's not too late. We still have seven, six more episodes after tonight. But tonight's drink is called the Hot Teddy, um, and uh, derived from the, the 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 famous mongoose of the of the second most famous mongoose ever. Uh, uh, of the story and it's uh it's a hot toddy it's bourbon and hot water but mary has designed this with uh fresh ginger uh some lemon juice honey cardamom cinnamon stick i put a little uh star anise in there as well i'm just putting a little bit in my cup at a time because i want to and it's on a burner here i have a little burner in my uh study to keep keep things hot when i'm up here so there it is that sounds delightful again if it were 40 degrees colder i would be absolutely imbibing that but 
Very good. Very spicy. I really like it. Well, um, Anastasia, it's, um, we have, well, you, we have one more show to do before you're gone. Uh, well, before we, then we do Hound of the Baskervilles. Um, well, I believe I have one show and then the wrap up show. If I'm yeah, oh, and the wrap up show we'll have to do with everybody on. That'll be fun. Um, but you, I've got also... it. I've got it all on a calendar, Ed, because otherwise <laughs> it, it's just a disaster. You are also teaching another, you're teaching an online course for, what is it, the Center of, what is it? For the Center for Fiction in New York City. Uh-huh. Um, so that's less of a course and more of a reading group. It's much more casual. So think of it as, I think, a more structured book club or uh -huh. almost something like this, but with slightly more people. Um, It is also virtual. It's on Wednesday nights uh, and it starts next week uh, and we'll be looking at some of the classics of the late 19th century including the sign of the four but also uh you know dracula uh wells's island of dr moreau and talking about these texts that essentially created so many of our foundational tropes so many of our fictional commonplaces you know the kind of mad scientist on his island somewhere or um, the the kind of the haunted portrait in the attic. Um, so so many of these classics, or of course Dracula and, and the vampire. Um, so many of these classics come from this very rich decade, the 1890s. Yeah. So uh, we'll be reading those um, over a span of five sessions and chatting about them. And I believe our lovely chat, Mrs. Hudson, is dropping the link in the um, YouTube chat right the now. Link is, the link's in the in the live chat. It's Archetypal Innovation at the Fin de Siècle, Creating the Modern Detective, Vampire, Gothic, and Scientist. So, yep, there you go. That is, that is, everything about that is something that I like. <laughs> we have a lot to thank the Victorians for. They really did. Yeah. Um, invent wholesale so much of modern literature although i have a medievalist friend visiting me right now she's in the other room don't tell her i said that because <laughs> i can almost hear the voice from the other room being like but in 12 something christine de pizan don't don't tell don't ever tell a medievalist that something was invented in like 1850 they will they will come for you with <laughs> notes and footnotes and citations well, you know, in spite of all the 19th century work I do now with all these 19th century authors, I am a medievalist at heart. Um, that I don't know if you know, that's where I, I not know that. Ed. That's where I started that when I was in college, I thought I was going to go off to grad school and be, an be a medievalist and do Arthurian literature. Um, I also loved Anglo-Saxon and Beowulf and, and all of that. And yeah, okay, I, still, I can I can see that. I still dabble in it um, uh, uh, on my own. Like like I, I still read those things. And I just got the, there's a brand new uh, edition of Beowulf just came out by Tom Shippey. And I just picked that up. Um, but I also still read all kinds of things about Arthurian lit and uh, uh, and enjoy that. Um, and uh, so I have actually actually that's very Victorian of you because there is. is kind of a bit of an Arthurian it revival is. in Victorian Britain with all of these ideas of nobility and chivalry yep. that Victorian gentlemen like to think of themselves as aspiring to. And I am finally reading something I've never read, which is Arthur Conan Doyle's The White Company. Uh, which oh, is boy. his adventure novel set in the 13th century about this company of archers that gets together. It goes off and uh, it's not 13th, 14th century, right? Yeah. 14th century. It goes off and fights in France uh, in the, in the hundred years war. And, uh, and I love Yeah. I have, I have a Sherlock of friend of mine who will tell you it's one of the most inaccurate historical novels probably in existence, which is and saying so, so much. And so enjoyable though. I mean, historical fiction is always written for the present anyway, and it has become more and more kind of accurate in its, you know, uh, as history, as time has gone on for the most part, but it doesn't like I want the adventure tale. I I want to read it like I like I read my Arthurian stories when as I was younger and be in the story and and do that. So yeah, I love that. So yeah, it's really good. I'm enjoying it. All righty. Well, enough of medieval talk. And uh, I, I and, and your course sounds wonderful. And and uh, uh, I I invite people to um, uh, also join that as well. 
on with our story for tonight. We have shared a PDF of a facsimile of the adventure of the Crooked Man, as it was originally published in the July 1893 issue of the Strand Magazine. You can download that on the Rosenbach's Sherlock Mondays page. And what I discovered, Anastasia, is, and this is going to play a role in mm-hmm. um, uh, in a couple things that I that I mentioned today um, in the story. Um, that there there do exist manuscript pages of the Crooked Man. Actually, four pages have been. Apparently, it was people knew they existed and they were in someone's collection. They knew who had it last, but then they didn't know what became of them. And then they went out they were actually sold at auction. Uh, I think in 20, in 23, 2023 at Sotheby's, they were sold at auction. Um, and it's just the first four pages, the first 1100 words of the story. Um, actually, you can see this at, um, I don't think I shared this with our, um, uh, our chat, Mrs. Hudson, but the, um, here it is. Here's a link to where information about those manuscript pages. I just put a link in the chat at the uh, at Randall Stock's Best of Sherlock Holmes website, in which he has a census of all of the manuscripts that exist for Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, and there are four pages of this, and and this is also a way of of prepping people because in the um uh a, 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 on episode 29 when we cover the empty house uh, i will share images and we'll talk about the manuscript for that which which resides at the rosenbeck this one um is totally interesting um let me just share do we know how it got scattered i actually don't know the story i do know with the hound of the baskervilles those pages are scattered because they were just disseminated as a as a kind of promotional thing. Yeah, this is, is a, why we're missing so many. Here's the crooked house right here. What happened was Doyle wasn't saving these early on, and then as his has as he went on in his career, he did start to to preserve them all himself, and he had them in these little you know uh, composition books. Um, but these this is this is one of the page. This is the opening page in the adventure of the crooked man. And I don't know how well you can see it. There's a little hole up top here. So they were all on these on this paper that and then they were pinned with some kind of, you know, some kind of pin went through them all, some kind of little tack thing to hold them all together. Um, And uh, and they went to. And then they were tight. See, I think this is what happened. I think all of his manuscripts, these manuscripts didn't go to be to the printer or to the to the magazine he had them typed up and i know i know that his sister was typing up everything at one point when they were all living together um and uh i'm pretty certain that most of his manuscripts were typed and then sent to the magazines to be published um so he wasn't and and he just himself didn't really take care of them i'll have more to say about this when we do the empty house manuscript um but um uh, yeah, but and look you're at right that about handwriting. You're right. Look at yeah. that legible handwriting. I once had to transcribe and annotate a non Sherlock Holmes story for a, a BSI press edition, or or not a BSI press. It was it was a different edition. Um, you know, I was asked to transcribe it, and first I said no because you know I don't want to deal with messy handwriting, and then the publisher showed me what Doyle's handwriting looks like, and I said yes, okay, I'll do it. It's it's so neat. It's so legible. You can tell that man was not a doctor by how legible that handwriting is. <laughs> well, we'll look at the we'll look at the opening uh, on the manuscript actually to start the story off tonight, and you'll see that he originally it was originally morning, and he changed it to night, and um uh, and that works especially well because you know of when he comes in, you know that it's late at night, and he tells the story late at night to to Watson, but also there's a fireside here that that he changed to hearth. And he, and, he, and he seemed to like that better. Um, but there are a couple other changes that happen in this manuscript, and we have the evidence of them in page four of this manuscript that I will share when we hit that point in the story. Um, but it opens one summer night a few months after my marriage. I was seated by my own hearth, smoking a last pipe and nodding over a noddle, 
novel for my day's work had been an exhausting one. Um, we are again, this is months after Watson's marriage. Um, and, which marriage? Well, yeah. So <laughs> if you play the game, then you have to wonder whether well, it could have been more than one marriage, but you that only happens if you try to create a chronology. If you yeah, don't I'm not, I'm not touching that with the 10-foot pole. <laughs> but if you don't try to create a chronology, it's just, it, it never matters. It's this, he was clearly married once, and then there's before and after stories. Um, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and and then after his wife dies, if that is what he means by a bereavement in, in this story mm-hmm. that, that we will cover um, later. Um, that, um, but it is... Uh, it takes place. He's not. I, I love while well, he's smoking his pipe, you know. So I love that. Um, this is this story then takes place not too long after the sign of four, because that's where he meets Mary Morstan and gets married, and and now you know that's what this is. Um, and uh, I'm just sorry that Doyle didn't name check the novel because he's name checked other novels in in his stories, and you know he could have name checked the Friends novel or something that he really liked. And then that I love that how they kind of add like when he. Like when he talks about them reading George Meredith or something like that. And it's kind of like, oh, that's interesting. And then you can get an idea of how he's envisioning these characters by what they read. But Mm -hmm. we don't get that. But we do know Watson is a reader. And he sits up late, smokes a pipe and reads. Guess what? Me too. So (laughs) this is exactly my life right here, except Sherlock's not knocking at the door. Yeah, I was going to say, do you have do you have an eccentric detective friend? <laughs> I wish. That would be great. I would be happily play the the not as smart foil to a detective uh, in my life. The conductor of light. Well, maybe I do. You know, my brilliant wife, and I'm kind of the, you know, not so bright, you know, foil to my wife and all of the wonderful things that she does. In the conductor of light, not in yourself, luminous. <laughs> yep. Um Sherlock stops by. Um, to my astonishment, it was Sherlock Holmes, and it's quarter to twelve at night. Um, Sherlock on his step. My dear fellow, pray come in. Um, this is the um how many times has he done this in short stories? And in 14 of the stories we've covered so far 14 of them begin at baker street okay and then there are four plus this one where we start at um at watson's home um right and and of those 14 the rygate squire that we did last week that kind of counts because actually Holmes is away and France sick, but then he mentions that we're back in Baker Street, and that's when they decide they're going to go off to to um, Surrey. But four other stories besides this one, can you can you name them? I, I I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I'm going to ask people to name them in the in the chat. There are four other stories that begin besides this one that begin on at in Watson's that not Baker Street. Um, and it is. And I think there, was I, one, there was one recently that I was on that I feel like was like that, but I don't want to, you know, go down a tangent. Well, it. I like that it starts here because it's a kind of. This story then begins with this visit to Watson's domestic residence, and 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 then the case we have is about a domestic disturbance for another couple. So, you know, they are. Oh, it was one of them was the man with the twisted lip. Man with the twisted lip is definitely one. Yeah. And there's uh, there's three others. See if anybody can name them. I haven't seen anybody trying to name them yet. People are frantically looking through their story, beginnings of stories like, oh, I have to, which one is it? Um, they, um, uh, yeah, but I, I like that this is, you know, this is a case about a domestic issue. So we start there. It's more appropriate than starting at Baker Street in a sense, even though plenty of other stories. Yeah. Oh, somebody just hit them, hit them right off the bat. Um, uh, Boscombe Valley, Engineer's Thumb, Twisted Lip. Oh, no, we still have one more. Somebody didn't name one more yet. There's one more. Um, 
This I mean, is technically a study in Scarlet does not start in Baker Street. Yes, it doesn't. And and I kind of left that off because it, there there is no Baker Street to start at. So or Watson's, you know, uh, uh, doesn't have Watson's place to start up with his wife. So it is. There you go. Um, mm -hmm. Sherlock comes for a late night visit. And right away, he starts in with the with the deductions about Watson. Um, and it is and uh, there's there's going to be this is going to be a big digression. I'm sorry, Anastasia, I got to do the digression on Arcadia mixture. You still smoke the Arcadia mixture of your bachelor days. No mistaking the flushy ash upon your coat. Of course, you know, Sherlock knows what ash looks like. Because he's written a monograph on that, upon the distinction between the ashes of various tobaccos. But of course, he's known Watson in his bachelor days, so he would know what kind of tobacco he smoked. But Watson didn't say he smoked this tobacco in Study in Scarlet. Mm -hmm. When they met, it was um, ship's tobacco, right? Um, he tells mm -hmm. Watson, tells Holmes that, oh, I always smoke ships myself. But now we find out. He also smokes Arcadia mixture. Well, where does Arcadia come from? Does it actually exist? It is not actually a real tobacco called Arcadia, but it did exist. Now, here's what it is. J.M. Barry. I don't know if you know this stuff at all. J.M. Barry. I do not. Close well, I know he wrote Peter Pan. Yes. And a friend of Conan Doyle. They even collaborated on a play, a little operetta that was that like failed, and and they were close. They were on the same cricket team. Barry had his own cricket team, and Doyle was on that cricket team with him. Um, Barry wrote a book called "My Lady Nicotine: A Study in Smoke," and it is about young men, one in particular, and all his friends um, who like to smoke and. One of them, the, the 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 novel starts, and it's kind of a series of ving vignettes. It's not like a kind of like it's just a interlinked vignettes about smoking <laughs> and enjoying life. Because the lead character, who I think is unnamed, I think it has to get married, and his new fiance, his his fiance, is like, well, we'll marry, but you're you're going to quit smoking. Um, and he, of course, agrees because he wants to be happily married. She doesn't want him to smoke, doesn't like it, I imagine. I can un I can understand that. The uh, somebody, uh, Madeline just got the the, the fourth one in, in the chat. It was stock. Oh, of stock. course. Of course, it was Madeline. Hi, Madeline. She I saw her two days ago. She was just here for a for a Sherlockian event. Boscombe Valley, Twisted Lip, Engineer's Thumb, Stockbroker's Clerk, and Crooked Man. Though the story so far that all start at Watson's, not in Baker Street. And then there's, of course, uh, Study in Scarlet, which doesn't start it either. Hmm. So Barry writes this book, My Lady Nicotine, and the characters in it smoke a tobacco called Arcadia Mixture. And it's this kind of mythically perfect blend of tobacco matter of fact here's here's the frontispiece for the book itself and this is exactly what the book is about oh wow <laughs> it's about a bunch of young guys just sitting around smoking all the time um this is like my dream life although it is true when i started smoking i smoked for years before i knew anybody else who also smoked a pipe and i've been in a pipe club and now i know a few people that smoke pipes but this is kind of like you know what i wish my life was like all the time so at some point in every day we'd got gather together and we'd all smoke our pipes so although i would i would not like it to be you know completely you know uh gender specific here i wish it would be you know many different people in there instead of just a bunch of you know i'm not you know but just instead of just a bunch of old white guys so um that's what i want to smoke a pipe with everybody but anyway that's what this book is about and they smoke a tobacco called arcadia no one who this is this is a quote from the book no one who smokes the arcadia would ever attempt to describe its delights 
for his pipe would be certain to go out. Um, it is this perfect tobacco that they smoke and they love. And he only recommends it to people who he absolutely is certain that he likes and are good people because God forbid he should one day discover this person to not be a good person. And then, Oh, I've told you the tobacco that is perfect. Well, <clears throat> it doesn't exist. He made it up for the novel, at least that name of it. Barry in real life smoked a blend called Craven, the Craven mixture. And it was made by the house of Carreras tobacco company. And later and I think uh, 1897, I think, he actually wrote a letter to them saying, yes, actually, the Craven mixture is Arcadia. Um, uh, that's what, I, so he admitted that that was the inspiration for Arcadia. And the Carreras Company for Craven mixture, then, of course, they started like advertising they put his quote on 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 their tins i have a picture of that um they loved this idea they couldn't believe that that he had that this their tobacco was arcadia mixture here's one of their old tins this is the back of it um and it's you can see over here on the one part of it, it says, Dear Sir, 18th January, 1897, in answer to your letter, it is your craven mixture and no other that I call the Arcadia in My Lady Nicotine. I see no objection to your announcing this if you want to do so. Yours truly signed, J.M. Barry. And not only did he, he see no objection, but they took that as like, okay, and they put it on their cans. And they every advertisement for decades for Craven Mixture featured J.M. Bar some some variation. Sometimes there were quotes from the novel about it, and they just absolutely played this up forever that this was you know the tobacco that uh, was featured. I in. mean that's delightful, but I'm personally fascinated by the picture of the cat. On the cat, yeah, and they also had a a, a cat. They had black cat cigarettes that they made with that cat on it. Um, that if you look up black cat cigarettes that Carreras used to make, they were really attractive looking uh, uh, logo for their for their cigarettes as well. Craven also made it into cigarettes. They 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 sold a Craven A um, uh, tobacco blend or cigarettes as well. Some people, some tobacco companies did start to manufacture their own tobaccos called Arcadia. So they just took the name and started putting it out there. But it was the Craven mixture that was actually Arcadia. So that Watson smokes Arcadia. This is a great shout out from Doyle to his friend J.M. Barry that he's putting the Arcadia mixture after reading Lady Nicotine. And and they they become friends that Doyle puts the mixture in here, the Arcadia in in the thing. So uh, I love that little you know bit of it's because it's really about friendship, right? It's about Doyle's and Barry's friendship and and Watson and Holmes. So there you go. So maybe Doyle's thinking of ba Barry as Watson to his Holmes. I don't know. <laughs> that's that's absolutely delightful. And Barry's another one of those figures, Anastasia, in the 1890s who, I mean, he's utterly brilliant. I mean, the fact that, you know, people still know Peter Pan, this is when, you know, I mean, it's created just after the turn of the century, Peter Pan and the play. I mean, there's just something in the air or yeah. the water in that decade. I mean, all these brilliant. I can creations. I can suggest a few things that were in the air and the water and the food, but um... <laughs> maybe absinthe. Um... <laughs> Maybe cocaine, uh, or at least in in in, uh, in Sherlock's life, or you know some mercury because they like using <laughs> that a lot for things. Uh, well, they fact, are. I believe I believe that was a treatment for syphilis was mercury, which uh, you can you can imagine is. exactly it how was. well that works. Yeah, yeah, and um, uh, another one of those cures that you know did more to you know hurt or kill the uh, uh, the patient than it did to help them. Um, Watson asks Holmes to stay, and this is the little picture from the um, uh, from Paget's from Paget's illustration. We'll just share a couple of these tonight. I'm not. 
I'm not so over the top about Paget's illustrations for this story, uh, which we'll talk about later when we see the crooked man. Um, but here they are at the beginning of the story. Watson's house got this nice little, you know, hat stand with all the walking sticks in it. Uh, it's a lot of walking sticks for, oh, well, no, that's one. there's an umbrella here too. So maybe there are a couple umbrellas actually, but Holmes is hanging his hat. Here's Watson's hat. Then Holmes is hanging his hat. He, uh, it leads Holmes to make these, you know, do his little Dr. Bell tricks where he is deductions. Whoa. You know, I see there was, you know, no gentleman visitors because I'm the only hat here. It's quarter to 12, dude. Like why would he have anybody else there anyway? <laughs> of course, well, Ed, stand is some empty. of us are nocturnal. <laughs> well, yeah, true. Watson could be entertaining late, but that's usually what bachelors do, not married men. Mm -hmm. So, um, Holmes comments he's had a British workman in the house because of the nail marks in the floor from a boot. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and then he says, I had some supper at Waterloo, but I'll smoke a pipe with you with pleasure, of course. So Watson hands him my pouch, which would have had Arcadia mixture in it. Um, if anybody's wondering what Arcadia mixture was, it was a what we call an English blend. Um, uh, and it would have had um, uh, a, 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 a tobacco in it, a condiment tobacco called Latakia. Uh, oriental tobacco and um they were called orientals or you could just call it latakia sometimes perique was used instead but it it's a very distinctive taste for tobacco and there was a company once recently and i used to buy it called mcclelland that you that did this 220b series and they did a black shag and they did an arcadia and it was very delicious because it was a very light latakia blend i'm not a I'm not a fan of heavy Latakia blends. Uh, pipe smokers know what this is, that it's it's really spicy and really heavy. Uh, I don't I don't generally do that. I smoke just Virginias, which, you know, don't have that flavor in it. But I like it lightly. And that Arcadia was really nice in that way. I'm, I'm so sorry it's not made anymore. Anyway, um, they have some Arcadia themselves. Uh, and... Um, uh, Holmes also has to comment on how he's um, uh, b busy right now uh, because he can tell by his boots. Holmes loves doing this. And then he's, and then Watson's like, oh, oh, I can't believe you can figure this out. Excellent, right? Uh, and Holmes says, elementary. My dear Watson. Yes. Well, he just says elementary. Yeah, so that's he, that's one of the inconceptions. He never says elementary, my dear Watson. That just but, came from an adaptation. But he does in the it does. It's one uh, one of the movies, uh, and I'm not sure which it is. Or it, it might even be it might even be Gillette. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Um, in the play, the early play, if somebody can let me know, um, when my elementary, my dear Watson, first shows up. But it's interesting, and it's, because it does show up. It's actually here in this text because yeah, he, he does say, you know, just elementary. So it's it's not no, in, he says all those words in this in this little speech. Elementary said he is one of these instances, blah, 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 that the same may be said, my dear fellow, blah, 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 blah. But I'll have them, Watson, I'll have them. So he actually says elementary, my dear Watson on the speech. <laughs> well, yeah, if you cross. So yeah. everything else. <laughs> no, but it's, it's all just, there. It's such a I mean, it's another one of those delightful little passages where what uh, excuse me, Holmes expounds about how his reasoning works. And it's sort of it's one of those um Terry Pratchett has this lovely quote where he says, Magic consists of just knowing one extra fact. Hmm. So it really goes back to that idea that um, you know, if you look at Holmes, you sometimes you might think he's almost like a wizard. He's a magician. He would have been burned at the stake in the Middle Ages. These are all things Watson has said to him. But it's not magic. It's just that he has a certain kind of knowledge that uh, and, and expertise that makes him seem like he has this kind of superhuman ability. But no, that superhuman ability is 
perfectly rational. It comes down to knowledge and, and observation yeah. and logic. That one little point that he says, which is the basis of deduction. If I, if you just have this one, that everything kind of seems that everything will come together. Without the one, everything is a real mystery. Um, yeah, and, and it's probably why Holmes shows up so often in science fiction, because in science fiction too, you have all of these things that seem like magic. You know, you can like appear out of thin air or whatnot, but then you've got the techno babble that explains it, and suddenly it seems all scientific and and logical and. Like, oh, okay, I understand how that works now in theory. Mm -hmm. We also have in this, it's it's usually Watson it, it, it frequently in the beginning of stories talks about how he chooses stories and what's interesting about them and 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 kind of gives us a little background to to how he's putting these together. And in a sense, this time it's actually Holmes doing that for for us, and that he talks about, he says, I um um the effect of some of these little sketches of yours, which is entirely meretricious, depending as it does upon your retaining in your own hands some factors in the problem, which are never imparted to the reader. And then he goes on to say that, like, actually, this case I'm on now, I have several threads, but I don't have the thing that I need, the one or two things that I need, um, which is, in a sense, him saying, this is like a case that you can write about right here. Holmes is giving him another story to write about. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then he asks absolutely. them to come with him. You know, uh, will you come with me to Aldershot? And of course, Watson says, I have no doubt Jackson would take my practice. So he's always got somebody that's going to help him out and see his patience while he goes away with Holmes. Watson. Watson has priorities. Yes. And, we know what they are. And so does Holmes. Holmes knows what they are. <laughs> and so does Watson. He freely admits it, like, of course I'm going to go. Why would who wouldn't go to solve a case when um uh, uh rather than see my patients and treat these people for awful Victorian diseases that I don't <laughs> really go near? So <laughs> uh, <laughs> prescribing mercury for several of his patients, I'm sure. Um well, Sherlock tells the story this time instead of a instead of a, 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 someone coming in with the case and telling their story. This time, Sherlock gets to tell the case, and it is um, a supposed murder. He calls it the supposed murder of Colonel Barkley of the Royal Mallows at Aldershot. Colonel Broccoli. Did I, I say broccoli? Said. There you go. No, it's just that's a Star Trek reference. And there, oh, are, there are people in the audience who will understand that. And for everybody else, <laughs> you don't need to. I'm sorry I didn't catch that then. Well, there's a character on Star Trek The Next Generation. His name is Barkley, but everybody mispronounces it broccoli for some reason to make fun of him. So <laughs> there you Next go. Next Generation, is that which one? Yeah. Yes. Is that your favorite of the Star Treks? Oh, no. I'm an original series girl. Okay. There's just there's so many so pretentious i prefer the original yeah well I but do. there's so many next generations that it's easy to just kind of get lost in those the next 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 generation yeah <laughs> well this is colonel barclay of the royal mallows at aldershot i thought royal mallows was a funny name for them um but actually and he says they were they were he tells watson right away that they were a um uh, they were an important regiment in the Crimean War, which was England versus Russia, and that's the whole Charge of the Light Brigade War. That's that that happened there, and and Florence Nightingale coming and and discovering all kinds of ways to take care of you know patients better. That was all in that war, and the mutiny. We're going to talk about the mutiny later when we get to the when we get meet the Crooked Man, but. I want to talk about the Mallows first, which I thought was a funny name, but that's just because Marshmallow and that's what we're used to. But it's actually the uh, name. Um, this is um, there is no Royal Mallow Regiment, first of all. Doyle invents this. But Mallow. Oh, my my edition actually says Royal Munsters. That's what we're going to get to. That's interesting. You okay. have an edition then that takes us. I, well, I text. have an edition that's yeah, falling, falling apart. But yes. And they have taken their text from the American publications of this, not the British. In well, that uh, would explain a number of things. 
this is a big and this is a big digression I'll have right now. But first, Mallow is a town in County Cork, Ireland. So what he's telling his readers is that the Royal Mallow Regiment, they're Irish. And they're and they're actually kind of working class Irish who make up most of the regiment. Of course, there would be officers too. Um, but they um, Irish. They're an oh, Irish oh. regiment because he calls them Mallows because they're from Mallow and that's where the regiment originally formed. But here's the whole big digression now. In the Strand editions, it says Royal Munster. The um, uh, I'm sorry. In the Strand, it says Mallows. In the American, in the Harpers, it says Mallows. And let me share that with you. What do I have here? Actually, all right. I'll share the I'll share the 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 American text first, which is here. This is the Harper's Magazine. Remember, it's Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, the top. And they just put the title here at the top of the story, Adventure of the Crooked Man. And, and here it is, the, uh, the Royal Munsters at Aldershot, which is even funnier for someone growing up in America because you just think of the Munsters, you know, TV show with Herman Munster and Lily Munster and Grandpa Munster and, and all of that. But it's the Royal Munsters at Aldershot. And then the Royal Munster, it goes on. It continues to be, it's about... The, the, this company is called the Royal Munsters. But in the manuscript, oh, and it's, and we have, we have just have the first four pages of the manuscript exist. And this is the fourth page. And this is where it is mentioned. And it says in the manuscript, the Royal Munsters. And he, actually, it's Munster here. The Royal Munster is. As you know, one of the most famous Irish regiments, um, and uh, it was originally, it was actually original, originally Robert Barker, not James Barclay here, um, and he's chained Barker to Barclay all throughout. Um, it was Annie Devoy, and now it's Nancy. But one of the things, see, but that's a correction that he has made. So when it was typed up and then sent to be printed, it was James Barclay. But this was not corrected, Munster. So his typescript that went to the printer, went to the magazines, said the Royal Munster. And then later, we don't, do we have the rest of it where he says, no, it doesn't, that'll be later. So, um, but it was Munster in the, in the typescript and in the manuscript. So probably the typescript as well. There was though, in real life, there was a Royal Munster Fusiliers that was formed in 1881 and they merged from other regiments to the time. They did not fight in the mutiny or the rebellion, whatever we're going to call it, in 57, 58, but they did serve in India later and then in the Boer War. So I think what what seems likely to me is that the Strand had this and they thought there is a royal Munster and you can't write about that. We would rather change it because there is an actual Royal Munster regiment that exists. So they, ch so it was changed to Mallows. But in America, when they just had that, you know, uh, typescript of Doyle's manuscript, they just figured they just printed what it said. They didn't, they didn't have an issue with it because they didn't think that there was a. They didn't realize that there might have been an actual, you know, regiment called that. Um, <clears throat> They don't. I don't think the Strand nor Doyle wanted the you know them to to write about you know a real company there. All right, that's number one. Number two, Doyle had already just written a story called "The Green Flag," which was published in June ninety three. This story is Crooked Man published in July ninety three in the Pall Mall Magazine. He wrote a story called "The Green Flag," in which a regiment that he calls the Royal Mallows features. And they're this kind of rough and tumble Irish soldiers. They're fighting in Egypt. Um, so he's just used it. And I think what happened is when they needed to change the name, he was, of course, oh, we'll just call it the Mallows. I've just invented that one anyway. And so he might as well mm -hmm. call it that. Um, or he's creating the 
or the Conan Doyle transmedia universe or the multiverse, you know, like Marvel. Yeah. And he uses it again. Later in 1900, he writes another story called The Debut of Bimbashi Joyce, in which this, uh, in which the Royal Mallows feature, and the head of that is their, and they're, they're fighting in, I forget where, um, India, I think this time. Um, and uh, so he's, you know, uh, um, uh, already, he's, so he's creating this kind of world in a sense, you know, right? He's writing it in a one story, he's putting a Sherlock Holmes story, he writes it in the story later. And and that is how um, the the change gets made. Um, there'll be more coming up in a little bit about this manuscript and and how this affects different texts. And I'm interested to see what you're going to have in a text in a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So it's the royal mallows, monsters, depending on your text, and that's where this colonel is. And um, uh. He was married to a Miss Nancy Devoy, her, her maiden name, and she was the daughter of a former color sergeant in the same corps. Um, and she is described as a woman of great beauty. <clears throat> Look at the end of this paragraph. We have woman of great beauty and that even now when she had been married for upwards of 30 years, she is still of a striking appearance. What do you have? Uh, a striking and queenly appearance. And queenly. How about that? Let's look at the manuscript. What does the manuscript say? The manuscript says a striking and queenly appearance. How about that? The American text is actually, actually more accurate to Doyle's manuscript than the strand text is in England. Oh, that's um, fascinating. And well, what I think it is, is that editors make changes in a text. Magazine editors do this all the time. I mean, all publishers do this, that they have the final say, especially with magazines and especially with magazines at this time, the editor runs the show. The editor decides what words, there's no real debate. It's just, you give the story, you've sold it, whatever. Then the editor makes whatever changes they're going to make to it. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that it's Doyle though, who seems to get the, at least they give him a say. And I think it's because we get Mallows in place of Munster that kind of says to me that Doyle suggested that because it's not like that other story, Green Flag was published in the Strand. It wasn't, it was published in the Paul Mall magazine. So they don't even, they, they might not even know it. So Doyle likely made that suggestion. So they're at least kind of consulting him. It puts me in mind of the story we did in the last episode, The Rygate Squire, in which we were wondering why the American version was called The Rygate Puzzle that was published in Harper's. Well, it's probably because the manuscript said Rygate Puzzle. And, and mine, of course, says Rygate Puzzle because I've got the American text. And when the Strand went to publish it, they decided they wanted to change it to Squire. We we talked about this last week, and I thought, like, maybe the Americans didn't like Squire, you know, because it sounded too British or something. But no, actually, that was probably just what it was called. But when it was published in The Strand, they decided, let's call it Squire. And then in the text, they even made a change. In the American text, it says... When it describes him, it calls him a man. And then the strand, it calls him a squire within the text, mm. probably in the manuscript. But the problem is the manuscript doesn't exist for Rygate Squire. All we have are like the last few lines and a fragment of the Rygate Squire. That's all that exists for that. So we don't know what the manuscript actually said. It probably said man. And then the British are the ones that changed it to squire. They changed the title from puzzle to squire. It all makes sense to me now. The Americans are actually publishing exactly what Doyle sends them. <laughs> mm -hmm. The Strand, they're going to make changes as they're going to make changes. So um, fascinating. I think that that's something that, and actually, someone pointed this out in the chat last week, and I and I did have this in one of my books. I can't remember which one. It might even be in in Klinger that in Sidney Paget's notebook. When he was doing the illustrations, he actually wrote down for the story, for the Rygate story, he wrote Rygate Puzzle. So 
he uh, he was already aware of the story is called that which again is just a whole nother reason to think like that's the original story that's what it was supposed to be the strand is the one that made the the the, the title change and in this story they have you know uh, uh made the change from mallows to munsters and um uh, and just little things like that like they just took out the end queenly that's just an editorial decision because it's within the the text it's not like they cut a sentence off it's just striking and queenly nobody can be queenly besides queen victoria no obviously one can be queenly apparently yeah they didn't like that um that's not unusual for british texts to take out references like that but by the 1890s i think it would have been um it's a little surprising i remember moby dick when Moby Dick is published, but this is back in, you know, 1850s, this is 40 years previous. Um, they took out all references to anything royal or kings or that kind of stuff. Um, when there's a whole chapter missing from Ro Moby Dick in the in the British edition, because he talks about whale oil being the, what christened kings. They're like, you can't talk about that. They cut out that whole chapter. The British edition has one less chapter because of that. All, all the chapter numbers get mixed up, too. Um but uh, well, if you do, you know, that 24 hour Moby Dick marathon you like to do in Britain, it'll be just a tiny bit shorter. It will be. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be one small chapter shorter. Well, all righty, that's um, that's a couple digressions that I needed to go down. So thank you for bearing with me, Anastasia and everyone else. Oh, bro. Uh, no, this this has been delightful. <laughs> we just started the story. We're literally at the beginning of the story. I, yeah, I was about to say we're literally two pages in, Ed, and it's been fifty minutes. Good. <laughs> well, we we're gonna stop. Today. We're gonna stop even longer because now I'm gonna take my mid break, and I want to tell everybody about handle the Baskervilles. But, um. First, I want to take this moment to thank all of you for watching this episode as a nonprofit I'm organization. Refresh my drink while you. You do that. As a nonprofit organization, the Rosenbach Museum and Library depends on the generosity of friends and supporters like you to keep programs like this free and accessible to hundreds of fellow Sherlockians worldwide. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach and Sherlock Mondays by donation, which you can do on our website, or you can become a member. Membership gives you free museum admission, discounts on programs and courses, and exclusive invitations to member-only events. You can learn more about how to become a member on our website. Part of membership is early access to program and course registration. And we've got some new things up there now for spring 2024. Member People in the Delancey Society, which is a, a high echelon, like, like they, they donate lots of money to the Rosenbach, they can register right now. Members can register for programs uh, starting on March 14th and then the general public on March 21st. So one of the benefits of membership is early access. We have some new courses. There's an in-person course on Plato's Dialogues in person at the Rosenbach. There's also an online course on Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. And there is a course, online course taught by Juliet Wells, who taught a great Emma course, Jane Austen's Emma course for us last year. She's doing a course on David Copperfield and Barbara Kingsolver's Demon Copperhead, which is an update David Copperfield in American Appalachia in the 20, 20th century. Um She's going to teach that course for us. I highly recommend those online courses that we do. They are a lot of fun. But I'll put on my deer stalker for the announcement. You can register this evening, no matter your status, members, non-members. When Sherlock Mondays comes to a close with the adventure of the empty house, we have one more. Put my head a little straighter there. There we go. We have one more Biblio venture to take you on. Sherlockian Biblio venture. We're going. We're going to have an exclusive, pay only series on the Hound of the Baskervilles. It'll be eight episodes available by paid subscription only. That will run on the Mondays in May and June. The same format. 
my wonderful co-hosts and myself in eight episodes, one each, one episode, one co-host on each episode with me talking about the Hound of the Baskervilles and eight serial parts. Um, it is available to register now. You can the 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 um uh um the the link will be in the live chat. A couple people have already registered because they went online and found it. Um, because I just went live. Um, there it is. Uh, looks like Vanessa might be the very first one, and then Victoria uh, signed up for it. Um, it costs eighty dollars, which I think is a very reasonable price for a course like this. That's ten dollars a session. Um, but if you're a member, it's fifty dollars. Um, that is a crazy deal for this. I hope you will all join me um, on our uh, tour. We're gonna take it. We're gonna take you to Dartmoor where a strange, diabolical hound haunts the moors, preying upon the heirs of Baskerville Hall. What will the logically reasoning Sherlock Holmes do when faced with a supernatural creature? Well, you don't want to miss out on this one, right, Anastasia? Yeah, well, absolutely. Start beginning it, believing in the supernatural immediately, of course. <laughs> sorry, I'm we'll sorry to spoil it. it. But of course... <laughs> Of course, that's what happened. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. It's going to be the um, eight Mondays. We're going to take a week off after this show, and then it'll start. So it'll be all the all the. Uh, if you're watching this live, it, it'll be the um, uh, Mondays in May and June. If you miss an episode. Um, we're going to record them and you will get an exclusive link that only you, you know, that you need the link to watch. Uh, and the, uh, all of the, all of the Hound of the Basketball episodes will remain for you to watch up to a month after it's over. So 30 days after those live shows end, you can still watch it if you have to catch up, if you had to miss a few, if you had to drop out at some point. So if you pay for it and you think like, oh, but I'm not going to be able to make all of these live episodes there will be recordings for you to watch that I will be able to share with you and only you. And this won't be, this isn't a show that we're going to make available to uh, uh, the public anytime soon. So this is really your only way to watch us talking about Hound of the Baskervilles. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, back to the story. There's no deer stalker in this story. They doesn't wear a deer stalker to Aldershot. So um, they, um, Back to the story. Uh, Holmes finds out that um, Colonel Barclay and his wife, Nancy, that um, uh, he loved her, it seems, more than she loved him, <laughs> at least according to, you know, Major Murphy uh, in the regiment, that um, that was the state of the, of the marriage that they thought. Um, and Mrs. Barclay... Um, is also Roman Catholic. Um, again, another nod that this is an Irish troop, so that actually made makes sense. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of the Irish regiments that made up the uh, uh, the British Army uh, were Catholic, obviously, because most, not all, most of Ireland was uh, Roman Catholic, um, and uh, and even some people like Wellington, um, uh, who came from Ireland. Um, uh, uh, and actually was a big fan of Irish emancipation and, you know, for them to be able to vote and all that stuff. So, uh, the, the military in, um, uh, the British army in England actually led the way in, uh, in, in, in getting more rights for the Irish as they went on because they were used to having them there and them fighting for them and giving their lives for the country or the empire, which we will hit. Anastasia, don't worry. Right. The shadow of the empire. Um, Barkley, the one we we do find out one thing about him though is that he is um uh, uh, depressed sometimes. He has a, a vindictive and violent streak in him um, that doesn't kind of make him seem like the nicest guy in the world. Maybe that's why the the marriage isn't perfect, uh, but. But this side think... of this side of his nature, however, appears never to have been turned towards his wife. You know, when I when I read that, I'm I'm always sort of like, really okay, but really, <laughs> yeah. 
I, I just, I'm, I'm so, I'm so skeptical. And um, well, I, I almost wish Monica was also on this show so she could do like her little um, counselor yeah. therapist kind of breakdown of that description. Monica's also written about written a, a piece uh, on a book in a book about uh, um, uh, uh, British wives in in India and um, uh, and and has a good bit of that chapter or that article uh, essay on on Nancy Barkley. Um, oh, I I will need to dig that. One that's out. in that book, the Colonels. Uh, it's in the Corporals, Colonels, and Commissionaires. Oh yes, yes Mike yes, Quigley yes. and uh, Marsha Pollock did. Um, uh, and there's a there's a piece in there on uh, uh, that she, uh, that Monica has written about that. Um, this Miss Barkley though, this Nancy Barkley, she she does a lot of charity work. Um, and uh, she has a friend, Miss Morrison, a young lady who lives in an ex villa. Um, and she'll come into play later. But Holmes is telling this story now of what happened. How did how did Barkley? How did Colonel Barkley die? And Holmes describes the room first. I love this. He, he describes like the scene of the crime. The room, which is used as a morning room, it faces the road. It opens by a large glass folding door onto the lawn. I mean, this is a this is a you know this is like a clue for us right away. I mean, as 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 especially as new readers are starting to read Sherlock Holmes stories, this seems like the kind of info you're supposed to pay attention to. Um, the the way the room is situated and that it's you know rooms opening. It's got a big glass window opening onto the lawn that leads out. You can the... see what's happening inside. The private is not private suddenly. Yeah. People can watch right from the road. They can see what's going on here, and that will come into play here. Um, the servants uh, tell the story that they heard the master, the colonel, and Nancy in a, in a furious altercation. Um, they say they only hear two voices, uh, those of Barclay and his wife, and then, but they also distinctly hear her saying, you coward, what can be done now? Give me back my life. I will never so much as breathe the same air as you again. You coward, you coward. That's quite a quote to remember. Um, but that's the quote that the that the servants have given that she had called out. Um, they uh, they hear a cry from a man and then a crash and then a woman scream. And then they can't get in the room and they have to go around. The one servant has to go around and come into the windows the, the windows that lead up to the lawn. Um, it's interesting. It, it becomes an, it's like an almost locked room mystery. There's a clear way into the room, but the door itself is locked. And then when they go in, they discover the key isn't there. The door is locked, but the key isn't on the colonel. The key's mm -hmm. not on the wife. The key's not in the room. So that makes it a kind of, it's like a variation of a locked room mystery. It's like almost mm -hmm. locked. You can get in the window, but why is that? How was the door locked then? And, you know, so anyway, um, it appears that the colonel died from, he's got a wound on the back of his head and there's a club there. But clearly they don't say that, like, I don't know, you could tell if the club hit him if the club would have the blood on it. But they don't even, you know, they don't they don't say that it does. Um and his head is upon the ground near the corner of the fender. Um, so it, it's it's almost like if you're a reader of the story, you could say like, well, he probably hit his head on that. Um, uh, and Holmes, I think, thinks the same thing. Um, uh, the club is a singular club of hand-carved wood with a bone handle. Um, the servants say that, you know, the, the colonel had a lot of these kinds of things that he brought back from his, you know, army life in, in India, but but they don't remember that one. So, all righty. Holmes Cross questions the servants and uh, um, doesn't learn anything except what we've heard, but, it, but it's the... It's the hearing the word David uttered twice by the lady, which which brings home so because because why Anastasia? What is the Colonel's first name? James. It is just James. Like, just like Watson. Well, <laughs> well, there you go. I think what Watson most, would most of Watson's the time anyway. Would have called. Well, it was her pet name for him. Mm -hmm. Um, but his name is James. So why was she saying David? 
Um, this is this is the other big clue that we have. And also, the contortion of the colonel's face in death had an expression of fear and horror so horrible that more than one person fainted at the mere sight of him. <laughs> um i find that really funny that like um, i i do too and it it's sort of it, it's one of those moments that at this point seems i think almost kind of a little cliche for me it rings bells of hounds of the baskerville you know that sort of thing um i believe murders in the rue Borg. their faces were also frozen yeah. with horror if i'm not mistaken so it's just a 19th century detective story kind of commonplace. The the face of the murder victim frozen in horror. Yeah, it, it happens in lots of horror stories, mystery stories that kind of, you know, picture on their face and, and it's actually never going to happen. <laughs> your muscles relax when you die. Your mouth may wind up open and your eyes open, but that's about it. Um well, they think, yeah. though, because of that, it is quite certain that he had foreseen his fate. Um, works works good for a story, though. Um, the um, uh, the wife, though, can't give any uh, information about what happens because she has brain fever. Yeah, um, and I believe you were talking, was it just last week or a couple of weeks ago with your co-host about brain fever in the stories? and um, well, not only how common it is, but how common it is for both male and female characters to yeah. come down with brain fever. Well, it's only been women so far, but we'll get a man soon. Um, uh, in Copper Beaches, Alice Rue Castle has brain fever. In uh, Cardboard Box, Sarah Cushing does when she find when she gets when she finds out her sister's been murdered. Um, and um, in Musgrave Ritual. Uh, that we that we just did uh Rachel the the fiery Welsh servant uh she has brain fever um mm -hmm. in Victoria lit this is always brought on by traumatic incident and the sufferers usually kind of delirious and unconscious kind of maybe you know both but we'll actually come across a male character having this in a Sherlock Holmes story soon I won't give it away uh when that is but that'll actually happen soon well, Holmes has all of this, you know, to go on here. There was, you know, the the door key is missing and, and a third person must have entered the room and all. But but to figure it all out, he, of course, says, having gathered these facts, Watson, I smoke several pipes over them. So well done, Sherlock. <laughs> uh, it is a several pipe problem is what it is. Not just three, several you'd think is more than three right mm -hmm. um they um the missing key the third person men a third person must have entered the room he says and the third person could have only come through the window um and uh and because he saw his footprints his footmarks on the lawn forward and back so holmes has already checked all this stuff out but it was not the man who surprised me it was his companion, his companion, Watson says, and he says, yeah, and he pulls out this piece of paper that has uh, drawings, tracings of footmarks of some small animal. It had five well-marked foot pads, an indication of long nails, and the whole print might be nearly as large as a dessert spoon. So little footprints, little cute little footprints. They must have been really cute. Of this Hello. animal going across. Um, it's a dog, said I. And Holmes says, did you ever hear of a dog running up a curtain? Because there was apparently a curtain and the footprints went up it. And um, uh, and so Watson thinks it was a monkey. And he says, no. It, Holmes tells him it was carnivorous. How do you know? Because that's why it went up the curtain. Because there was a canary cage there. It was going after the bird. Um, Holmes says, Figures out the length of this animal by measuring the distance between the footprints. And, um, uh, but he doesn't quite know what it is yet. What? What is this animal that we have to find out about? Well, we're not going to find well, out. Well, if I had to guess, I would say it's from somewhere in the Brit in, in the vast holdings of the British Empire that is not 
Britain itself that seems like it might make sense. I wonder if, 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 if an original forward. reader, I wonder if an original reader would have immediately been like, oh, I know what that is. So it could have been. So, well, when we find out who it is, we'll, we'll talk about the that actual animal, what people may have known then about it. Well, Holmes also realizes that there was a man who stood in the road who saw the Barclays in an argument. Well, I do actually, I, I do want to mention about the the way Holmes says, I, I tried to reconstruct it from the measurements and the prints of the beast, uh -huh. you know, the, the footprints and everything. Uh, that's so interesting to me because the 19th century is really this flourishing of paleontology. Yeah. Uh, this reevaluation of fossils, this discovery of fossils and bones and trying to figure out what these creatures look like. But you have their bones and their footprints, but there's only so much you can deduce from that you know you can try to use comparative anatomy and whatnot but for example if you look at like a giraffe or an elephant what its bones look like is not what the animal looks like at all so Holmes here is almost being like a paleontologist which is was sort of a big big thing a big discipline of interest in the mm -hmm. 19th century he's being a paleontologist who's you know these are the prints these are some of the other features and I'm going to use sort of um, logic and comparative anatomy to guess at what it might have looked like, but you know, who knows? And there's so much taxonomy going on at the time. And this is all, you know, starting in the late, you know, 18th century, but going up all through the 19th. And and it's but it's also all tied in with 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 the empire. And as they explore the earth more and spread their empire, they're discovering so many new animals and things, and they all get put in. In, in well discovering new flora and fauna but ones that often challenge existing classifications right you have yeah. all of these understandings this great chain of being of what you know kind of creature or what um, organism goes where but then as you discover you know plants and animals from australia or, or india or or where have you those classifications that underpin the british worldview sort of get challenged get deconstructed a little and it was very uncomfortable in many ways and this is happening side by side with darwinian theories of evolution darwin um kind of suggesting you know uh these classifications are aren't static species change over time and they go extinct um and so that kind of static orderly worldview that had been the case for a long time that the you know British scientists were very much trying to maintain this idea of like a static, comprehensible world, but all of these discoveries were just undermining it and, and really just kind of exploding it. Yeah, yeah. And Holmes is is a scientist. I mean, he approaches life like, I mean, he's always using these kind of scientific practices. So this is him measuring the animal, figuring out, well, this is what I have for the footprints. And what's fascinating is, because it works with this deductive method that Doyle has kind of set up for him. And that if I have this, now let me imagine what the animal is. And, you know, it. but it wouldn't, he wouldn't have to think too hard about what it is really, because people should have known what this animal is. But, but let's talk about that when we get to him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I like how Doyle is, Using it, though, to throw out clues at his audience, you know, and to keep it a little more mysterious, like there's a little animal involved here and it's carnivorous and it's small. Um, and and uh, uh, for those and probably most people wouldn't know what it was. Well, and it gives the crime this little like free zone of of the foreign of the unfamiliar, because otherwise it's just a murder. Right. You know, yeah. it's uh, one guy stole or stole a woman from another guy and, and there's a murder over it. Like that, that would just, it's not that complicated, but yeah, here you have this kind of um, taste of the foreign, this taste of the exotic, the unknown that, yeah. that for a British reader specifically would have made this kind of more frightening, you know, something, something foreign entering this, a lovely sitting room with the French windows going out onto the this beautiful British lawn, mm -hmm. lawn with the hedges, and yeah. it, it's it's frightening, it's discomforting. Holmes then also says that she uh, 
uh, what what he, what he finds interesting is that she immediately it because she immediately returned home or after she immediately returned immediately after she returned home she went right to have tea she f- flown to tea he says i love that you know um as an agitated woman will this kind of like tea is needed to soothe people um uh especially women of course uh in 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 this time but um uh the men would have gone right for the brandy right i was i was about to say you know for the men it's quick the brandy but for the quick women the it's quick the tea quick have some tea can you imagine can you imagine in dracula <laughs> people are swooning left and right and the doctor or steward or whoever is like quick the tea instead of quick the brandy yeah. be like <laughs> i was spitting that out what are you what are you doing <laughs> i thought i got brandy Please. at least put some booze in that tea <laughs> Uh, just like my hot teddy that I'm drinking here. Um, Holmes also, uh, so he realizes that something happened between when she left the house and nine o'clock when she returned. That's the key. And that also the reference to David, he's got to figure that out. Um, and, uh, and he never does actually until the end when it all comes together and then he realizes what it is. Well, he questions Miss Morrison, the friend of, uh, of Nancy Barkley who, who went out with her. Um, and finds out that um, uh, I like her description too. He says, Doyle, Doyle describes her as, or Holmes describes her as Miss Morrison is a little ethereal slip of a girl with timid eyes and blonde hair, but I found her by no means wanting in shrewdness and common sense. I like how Holmes doesn't assume she's just going to be because she's an ethereal slip of a girl with timid eyes and blonde hair that she. <laughs> that she's going to be vacuous that like oh she's actually you know shrewd and and has common sense that he recognizes that in people without you know resorting to without assuming what they're what they are like um uh she says uh miss morrison says that she promised she wouldn't say anything but but since you know nancy barkley is suffering from brain fever and can't speak that she better tell what happened that she's absolved from that promise and she talks about how when they were out they came across a man coming towards them with his back very bent and something like a box slung over one of his shoulders and i'll share the paget illustration of that and here's the pageant. I I wasn't in love with the pageant illustrations for this. Um, yeah, there's the servants trying to get in the door. I, I it just doesn't. I mean, and here's Holmes showing him the footprints. I I felt like there was there would have been some interesting things to do in this story, but that we didn't really get. Well, here's the. Here they are. Here he is with his you know look of surprise on his face. Um, he's wearing the turban, which makes him more exotic looking. So we know where he's from. The the box here, which will have Teddy in there that we'll learn learn about at the end of the story. You've all read it. It's not a spoiler. Um, and here are the here's I'm assuming this is Nancy, and this is her friend Miss Morrison next to her. Um, kind of Miss Morrison looks surprised. We can't really see the look on uh, Nancy's face, but certainly the crooked man is with his um uh uh cane and he's bent over but it, uh, what i also find interesting about the picture is, is if you don't know the story it looks like he's kneeling down right it looks like he's about to genuflect in front of her um uh and uh and that's the pageant illustration for it he says my um uh and he says my god it's nancy she says i thought you had been dead this 30 years henry um, so I have, said he, and he had a very dark, fearsome face, face and a gleam in his eyes that comes back to me in my dreams, Miss Morrison says about him. Um, but Nancy just tells her, don't worry, it's just an old acquaintance. She's who's come down in the world. You don't have to worry about him. They talk for a little bit, Nancy and the crooked man and and without Miss Morrison hearing what they said. And Holmes knows now. I got this is the key. Clearly, she ran into this guy. This isn't a coincidence. Holmes doesn't believe in coincidences. This is must be a part of this is a, a key to finding out what went on. 
And Holmes finds out his name is uh, Henry Wood. He is a conjurer and performer by trade. He carries some creature about with him in his box. It's interesting that Holmes didn't find out what the creature was at this point. That He just you know, knows that he carries a creature in a box. Uh, if he found that he was a conjurer and performer, he should have found out what he was performing and, and how he was using mm-hmm. that. Um, and then where he finds out where he's staying and he gave the landlady a bad florin, the landlady thought, but it turned out it's an Indian rupee that Holmes, it was an Indian coin. So now he, like he's, Holmes is putting this together. He realizes he must have seen the quarrel in the window, rushed in, the creature he has in his box got loose. And Watson says, and you intend to ask him? Most certainly, but in the presence of a witness. And I am the witness? Of course you are, Watson. <laughs> you better be the witness. It's so interesting to me because Holmes shows up and he he's sort of like, you know, Watson, come with me. There's the crime to solve. Um, Watson doesn't really assist in the solving of the crime. Watson is just there to be a witness, but also the crime solving is just, he talks to one person who tells him what happened. And then he talks to a second person who tells him what happened. There really is not very much it is solving. it is though the way that Holmes works in that frequently when he hears about a case and here we've just heard him telling this the case instead but he has that moment where he thinks about it and he's like okay and like we know he's already figured it out and then he just has to go and put those final pieces together to make sure what he's figured it out works so it is actually the same process as usually happens we just see it all with him sitting in front of Watson. And now I just need you to come with me to be a witness. Poor Watson just doesn't get to go and help solve this one. There's no adventure in this one. It might be called the adventure of the crooked man. There ain't no adventure um, for Holmes and Watson. There was adventure for the crooked man for Henry Wood, or is Henry Wood the crooked man? Um, we'll talk about that at the end. Um they um uh watson's going to be the witness so they head to elder shot and then they hear and here is simpson to report um and he's in all right mr holmes cried a small street arab running up to us he's not actually an arab from you know the middle east this is one of his what his homes called him he says it in the beginning there he says um uh one of my uh Baker Street boy. I have one of my Baker Street boys mounting guard over the him. The Baker Street Irregulars, the the you know, not to be confused with the literary society. Is yeah, and and they he's had one of them, Simpson, who's the head of them that he uses to keep an eye. And you know how many stories the Baker Street Irregulars are mentioned in? How many? Three. Sign of study in Scarlet, sign of four, and this one for a group oh, wow. that is so famous, you'd think that they're in a lot. This is it. This is like the three stories. Well, it's I really mean, interesting. You, you know, you know how Sherlockians like to latch onto something that was mentioned once or twice. Well, there has eyes and ears everywhere, and they can help them in so many cases, and yet we only have well, that's just because these are the only cases that Watson has chosen to tell us there were all those cases where Holmes used them and then solved the case, but Watson didn't, wasn't there. It wasn't a part of that case. So that's what it is, right? Mm -hmm. There were thousands of cases, at least hundreds of cases where they helped him, but Watson wasn't a part. He didn't need Watson because he had the Baker street irregulars to go out and find stuff and go on an adventure. So there you go. We're, Um, we're very important. There you go. Um, they um uh he's been keeping an eye on henry wood to make sure he didn't leave the house until holmes got there and and he hasn't and holmes and watson now confront henry wood uh they find him crouching over a fire and the little room was like an oven um the man sat all twisted and huddled in his chair in a way which gave an indescribable impression of deformity but the face which he turned towards us, though worn and swarthy, must at some time have been remarkable for its beauty. Um, that's how Watson describes him, that um, obviously he keeps the room warm. He's so used to the you know hot climate where he was living for so long and in India. Um, and, uh, um, 
And then Henry Wood is going to tell his story. And I've, I've talked about this in other episodes that so many times in Sherlock Holmes stories, there are people telling stories. And actually in this story, it's we have two stories. Sherlock Holmes told a story. And now Henry Wood comes on and tells a story. Um, and uh, Sherlock Holmes stories are about people telling stories, you know, how, and, and if we want to get, you know, you know, kind of, you know, critical about that, their narratives, narratives reveal truths, stories reveal truths. You know, we don't, we don't get people telling stories that are untrue. Nobody tells a story. And then Holmes is like, Oh, that's not true. Or Holmes tells a story that winds up not being true unless there's a, it's a key part of something, but the tale is always the truth in Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, and, uh, and for this one, Wood is going to tell a story about India, uh, the British Empire, uh, just like we had in Sign of Four when we started with, you know, Jonathan Small telling about his adventure. Well, I have to I have to make a small plug here. I just need to grab the book. So if you are interested in um, Sherlock Holmes and Empire, there's actually this lovely volume that um, was just recently published by BSI Press, and it is called Sherlock Holmes and the British Empire. I'm going to hold it because it's it's blurry for some reason, but um, so and that was yeah. from. Go ahead. Yeah, so this was a conference that was held over this past summer, so summer of 2023, um, and these are all of the papers that were given um, at this conference. So a number of wonderful, wonderful Sherlockians talking about all the various aspects of how the empire is portrayed in the canon um we have a wonderful sherlockian from india whose name is jay who um writes uh gave a talk about the great agra treasure and the canonical plundering of india uh which um is really lovely so uh i believe if you just go on the bsi press website or you know just um look this up you can find this so that is that is my my little spiel. I just really wish this wasn't sort of like I don't know. Maybe if I hold it up, let's see. That's enough. Yeah. So there you go. Um, so I'm really looking forward to making my way through this entire Good. volume. Post about that on our Facebook group too, and then people absolutely can yes. Um, Holmes. Um, Holmes tell well before the story even Holmes tells that uh, uh, Wood that you know the. Mrs. Barkley will be tried for murder and he's shocked and he's, and, and he says, well, you know, well, what are you the police? And Holmes says, no, but he's home says it's every man's business to see justice done. So um, that's why Holmes is here uh, just to see justice done. And uh, he asked them, you know, who killed um, uh, Colonel James Barkley and Wood says it was a just providence that killed him that's that's why he died and now he tells this story and about how he was you know uh um uh they were in the same regiment that it was the 117th foot then before it became you know the royal mallows or munster or whichever we want it to be um and there was a girl who was the daughter of the color sergeant who was beautiful, Nancy, and she actually loved wood. So they were, and, and he also says they were at a place called Bertie. Um, he says, we shall call at a place we'll call Bertie, which is interesting because there is no Bertie in India. Um, and, uh, um, but even, Doyle and and fiction writers will often give, you know, a fake name for something. And as he does all through the stories when they go to, you know, places that are imaginary to solve crimes, but it's 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 India. And he, he's even extend he even extends that to the character. The character himself is saying, um, it's a place we'll call Bertie. Um mm -hmm. uh, that he's not even saying where where it's actually where it actually happened. Um they were um uh and it is she loves wood, but her father likes um uh uh Barkley. Um 
And Though I had her heart, her father was set upon her marrying Barclay. Yeah. What's that? Her heart? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just reading the yeah. line from the yeah. story. And it's because Wood is, he says, I was a harem, scarum, reckless lad. And he had an education and was already marked for the sword belt for, you know, promotion. I mean, it's a class difference is that mm -hmm. Nancy's father realizes that, you know, you know, uh, Barkley's got a future and and Wood's just going to be a common soldier for his whole life. So mm -hmm. um, that's who he wants her to marry. But the mutiny happens. The mutiny broke out. Um we covered the mutiny a little bit in sign, sign of four, because that was Jonathan Small's big adventure when the when the uh, great mutiny broke out. It's a real historical event, um, just like Watson's you know second Afghan war that he's wounded in. The mutiny occurred in 1857 to 58, uh, and it's when the Indian uh, natives, the people that lived in India, were finally fed up <laughs> with their rule with the British Empire. Yeah, and they have a rebellion. Um, which, you know, um, uh, which was finally, you know, quashed by the by the military after much loss of life on both sides. It ended uh, so the East significantly, India... significantly more on the British, uh, excuse me, on the Indian side than the British side. And it ended as, with as the, that tends to go. The East India Company's power in India was taken away. Now, the British government would be in charge of, of it. But I love the idea how it's. It was then always called the mutiny and the great mutiny, not the rebellion. A mutiny is, is an illegal act that people take against authority, right? And it's, and it's supposed to not be a good thing. Like that's a crime, a mutiny, but a rebellion, that's like, you know, that's- A that, rebellion that, can be heroic. Yeah, and, and against injustice. And it was, <laughs> Um and the empire chooses the word mutiny to describe it, but plenty of people in India call it, you know, some even, it's, it's sometimes even referred to as the great, the first war of independence or something like that. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and I mean, historically, so um, India acquired its independence um, finally in 1947. So it would take pretty much exactly 90 years after this mutiny for um, for them to gain their independence and for to finally be free of British rule. Well, when this rebellion happens, I'm going to call it a rebellion. Um, they're trapped in Bertie. Their regiment is trapped. And uh, Wood himself volunteers to go out to another general to like, you know, travel to find another general to tell them that we need to be relieved. And Barkley who knows the area apparently better says, here's a route you're supposed to take. And, and he does that. And uh, Wood says there were thousand, there were a thousand lives to save, but it was only one that I was thinking when I dropped over the wall that night, he's just trying to save Nancy, um, not even himself. He, he needs to save Nancy. That's why he's going on this mission, but he walked right into six of the, you know, enemy sentries, who were crouching down in the dark, waiting for me. I mean, it's it's an ambush. Yeah. And he finds out later, he overhears them talking, that it was Barkley himself who betrayed him and told them that through a servant, told them that, you know, somebody's going to be coming through that I want you to. I'm so shocked, Ed. Capture. I'm so shocked that this is what happened. Yeah. I, I didn't see this coming at all. <laughs> Well, Barkley betrays him, and then Wood goes on this long journey for 30 years, right? He's a prisoner. He's constantly tortured. Uh, this is what causes him to be so deformed and, and hunched over all the time as the crooked man. He becomes a slave at one point, um, and he escapes, and he wanders around. He becomes a conjurer just to you know support himself, wandering around, and he finally realizes, you know, what use was it for me, a wretched, a wretched cripple, to go back to England or to make myself known to my old comrades? Even my wish for revenge would not make me do that. Um, that he's not thinking of coming back to get revenge and find out where yeah, Barkley well, is. Well, and 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 here I think you know I think we should pause to note some you know good old fashioned Victorian ableism where sort of you know 
today we would say, yes, he's he's become disabled through all of these things he went through, but he's still, you know, a human being. He's still the person Nancy loved. Why, you know, why why doesn't he come back? Um, but it's sort of this this Victorian discomfort with anybody who was not kind of able-bodied who was not physically as they you know quote unquote should be and of course yeah. there was a lot of kind of moralizing around that in the victorian era where if you're disabled if you're somehow kind of not able-bodied that that there is a kind of moral signification there um which we see so often in fiction where you know the the good people are are the good looking people uh, but there's also the fact that he has been abroad for 30 years. He's been in India and Afghanistan and, and, and all of these places. So all of these kind of imperial holdings or fringes of empire. So these places that are, again, foreign. And he has been tainted by the, this foreignness. He's been literally made sort of physically deformed. Yeah. Uh, he He is physically different now. He needs a different climate, as we saw from him warming warming his room he um in the illustration he was wearing that um headdress uh he has this mongoose so he's no longer entirely british he has been infected with non-britishness and all of these ways that can be physically signified and physically read onto his body and that is part of the reason that that he cannot come back he cannot come back to his yeah. comrades he cannot come back to nancy and we might notice there's no happily ever after where, you know, now that Barclay is dead, Nancy marries Henry Wood and they, they live happily ever after together because they, they love each other and they're reunited. There is nothing like that here because you cannot have that. He is he is a different person now. He is a, a tainted person now. And she's been married to a, 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 um, a military officer of high standing for many years. You just don't cross that divide that's not acceptable within the kind of victorian social configuration is that the shadow of the empire here his deformity him not being able to come back and be you know a uh, uh, irish or 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 or, or you know english speaking citizen again i mean there's there's so many shadows because, of empire here yeah because he's not he does he hasn't become a criminal like jonathan small did jonathan small kind of goes evil and uh, uh, and continues to be evil and and wants to hurt people because of you know his experience. Uh, in this case, it's actually that Wood remains a good guy, right? Like I'm not going to get revenge. I'm just going to say, hey, that's you know I can't do anything about this. Um, uh, I don't want the girl. Yeah, and yet and yet somehow that's not enough because yeah. he is not British anymore. You know, he's yeah. not British. British. He is again. He has been tainted and physically changed by foreignness uh -huh. in a way where he cannot return. He cannot reintegrate. He cannot have Nancy back. He, he cannot do any of those things. And, yeah. and, and I think that more than anything is the shadow of empire where the British empire spread across the globe, but yeah. you know, not to beat the dead horse in saying this, but it spread across the globe. And yet, there was such anxiety about this foreignness, about bringing back that foreignness and about tainting the British homeland with that foreignness. We have that in so many Sherlock Holmes stories. We have that in um, the picture of Dorian Gray, where he, where um, Dorian visits opium dens, but also the docks, which is where the foreign ships come from. We have that in Dracula, who is a foreigner who is invading Britain and preying on British women. It's, you gain all of these territories, you gain all of these economic benefits, all of these goods, um, all of access to all of these trade routes is economically beneficial, but it comes with this dark side of, but that might also come with infection, yeah. both literal. I mean, you can bring back diseases that you have not encountered before, but also metaphorical sort of diseases in terms of, foreign ways of being foreign cultures and, and and so on and there was so much anxiety about i mean victorian literature is just 
yeah. soak through with that anxiety. And that, and that anxiety is even evident in people who were fully in support of British Empire, as, as Conan Doyle was. Um, it still kind of creeps into his work that even though he's like, the, even though he would think and he would say the British Empire is a good thing, yet he can't, that this thing keeps creeping into his story. So we've seen. Yeah, well, yeah. any any good thing can still have its, it's dangerous downsides and you yeah. have to be careful even if it's overall beneficial there's still things you have to be careful about yeah. and even proponents of the british empire acknowledge that that you have to be kind of wary you have to be attentive well the only thing that brings barkley back home is his kind of longing for home you know this kind of little bit of nostalgia that hits him or something so he decides to come back home and then just unfortunately runs in the Nancy. Like if he had not doesn't run into her, this doesn't happen. Well, I say unfortunately, it's actually fortunate in a sense, right? <laughs> because when he then goes to confront them and he sees them arguing, he goes in to confront them. He doesn't even have to get his, he doesn't even have to do anything to Barkley. He says, at the sight of me, <laughs> he looked as I have never seen a man look before and over he went with his head on the fender, but he was dead before he fell. I read death on his face as plain as I can read that text over the fire that the bare sight of me was like a bullet through his guilty heart. Um, that's the best revenge, right? Like, mm -hmm. I didn't even have to hurt you. You just died looking at me. Well, and and he lived for 30 years in abject anxiety over what he had done. It's very sort of almost poesque where he got away with the crime like he got away with him but it's his own guilt that's not letting him live yeah well now we finally meet teddy well we finally hear about teddy uh in uh he, he wood says in my haste i thrust the key into my pocket we find out what happened to the key to the room and he says i dropped my stick while i was chasing teddy who had run up the curtain who's teddy asked holmes and he says, the man leaned over and pulled up the front of a kind of hutch in the corner. In an instant, out there slipped a beautiful reddish-brown creature, thin in life with the legs of a stoat, a long, thin nose, and a pair of the finest red eyes that ever I saw in an animal's head. I mean, Watson's in love with Teddy here. Like, <laughs> he's describing like he describes the women he usually sees. Um, it's a mongoose, I cried. Um well, uh, you know, at least at least Watson recognizes it now because he's been in <laughs> Afghanistan and and he's been over in the you know the imperial holdings. Watson's been all over the world, apparently. Um, he says, has the knowledge of women. How many continents? Three continents, and uh -huh. Sherlockians to this day argue over which three continents. Well, Victorians uh, really could have read of a mongoose in magazines. Um, and especially how they could fight and defeat cobras. I actually was reading a piece in a magazine for the Victoria. I can't remember which one. And it was about literally a little piece like was in a regular magazine about a mongoose fighting a cobra. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and of course for wood, he's not going to take any chances when he has Teddy fight his cobra. He, t the cobra's defanged, but so it's kind of like a trick that he has Teddy, but, but mongooses could do this. And they were apparently, one of the I don't know how true in life this is, but in the one piece I read in the Victorian journal, uh, they the soldiers have a mongoose fight a cobra and the cobra does bite the mongoose, but the mongoose doesn't. And apparently they they realize that the mongoose isn't affected by the venom. Um, I don't know if that's true in real life, but that was what they believed. Um, and of course, Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book which contains a story about Ricky Ticky Tavi, the most famous mongoose. Teddy will have to be the second most famous mongoose or Jeff, the talking mongoose from the 20th century. If somebody might know what that is, might come into play too, but that was actually a weasel, not a mongoose. Look up Jeff, J G E F the talking mongoose. There was a mongoose that people said talked and because it was inhabited by spirits. But anyway, um, Ricky Ticky Tavi, was in the Jungle Book, which was published in 1894, um, just a year after this story. But Doyle also shared a literary agent with Kipling. Uh, A.P. Watt was Doyle's literary agent that was able to get his stories placed better, uh, and and was able was one of the reasons why Doyle becomes you know this famous you know well published writer. Kipling was also uh, 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 
Uh, it, Watt was also Kiplin's agent. So Doyle winds up getting to know Kiplin. They spend some time together. They're, they're kind of friends, but they're never the close friends. Um, uh, but uh, that Ricky Ticky Tavi story will come out soon too. So it's just another, it's not yet. This is 1893. That's not another year that Doyle, that Kipling's Jungle Book comes out. But people have read stories about this and, and, and understand the Victorians. It's one of those exotic animals from the empire that they have discovered because of the empire. I'm just disappointed we don't get a pick. We don't. We, this story really needs an illustration of Teddy, and especially Teddy fighting the cobra. I think would have been a perfect illustration. Absolutely. I have no idea why we don't get it. Well, the story finishes up here with with uh, Wood promising that he'll come forward if 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 needed to testify for Nancy, um, and then Holmes says. But if not, there is no object in raking up this scandal against the dead man foully as he have as he has acted. You have at least the satisfaction of knowing that for 30 years of his life, his conscience bitterly reproached him for his wicked deed. And we have these stories that we heard from, you know, uh, Major Murphy in, in the regiment that um, Barkley was frequently depressed and and bothered by something always. So he's kind carried this guilt with him his whole life. Um, but but again, as as we've seen in so many stories, reputation is everything, especially yeah. if you're a man of class or, or a woman of class. Reputation rather is everything. Protect a bad man's reputation rather than expose it to light. As long as there's nothing to be gained, like there's nothing to be gained here. Wood's not going to gain anything by people finding this out. And Barclay's already dead. The wife doesn't gain. Well, you know, per, presumably either. there can be some amount of justice in in the public knowing what truly happened. But but that's again, what I in would the, think. In the Vic- yes, that's what we as modern readers would think. But in the Victorian mindset, really class and reputation as it is tied to class is just so so important in other stories like the boscombe valley mystery where you know um they discover the 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 the, that it's bad that that the murderer is really black jack ballarat and so holmes covers that up because if that comes out it actually affects his daughter um Mm -hmm. So like there's and this happens in another story too. I can't remember which one where it would it affects the heirs. So Holmes is like people don't need to know this. Um, oh, it's in uh, it's in uh, Gloria Scott too. Um, no, mm-hmm. There's no reason for people to know about this because it'll affect the people coming after it. But in this story, there's no heirs. Well, I guess it's Nancy. I mean, it, it's there, it, there is Nancy, and the, you know, I suppose there is sort of something to be considered in terms of her reputation here. I mean, she's going to be. So you would you would think if she were truly in love with Harry Henry Wood, she would want the truth out. But we never hear her talk. She's sort of she's off stage. She has brain fever. She doesn't get a word in edgewise. I mean, uh, maybe that no could happen Delta later. Has to be passed here. Maybe she winds up saying, "You know what, Henry? I don't care how bent you are. I'll still love you." Yeah, you know, that's the future. That's such um, a modern take. It's not going to happen. Such a modern take. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen in this story. Well, Holmes leaves and they run into the uh, uh, the uh, Major Murphy uh, and uh, they discover that uh, Murphy tells them the inquest is just over. The medical evidence showed conclusively the death was due to apoplexy. So he had a stroke and died. So clearly he wasn't murdered. You can see, you see, it was quite a simple case after all. And Holmes says, oh, remarkably superficial, said Holmes, smiling in very sarcastic, right? Like Holmes is like, yeah, you actually don't know anything about this. It was not simple. It was like a whole story about, you know, betrayal and and all of this. But that's, that's, you know, nobody needs to know the complications of this. And then we get to the end of the story and uh, Watson's like, wait, if the husband's name was James and the other was Henry, what was this talk about David? And Holmes tells him it was a evidently a term of reproach. And why don't you read that last paragraph there? Uh, yes, David strayed a little occasionally, you know, and on one occasion in the same direction as Sergeant James Barkley. 
You remember the small, small affair of Uriah and Bathsheba. My biblical knowledge is a trifle rusty, I fear. But you will find the story in the first or second Samuel. And it is the King David from the Bible, and it's in the second book of Samuel where he sees Bathsheba and falls in love with her. Actually, they actually went her and but she has a husband, Uriah. Actually, Uriah's away fighting, so David and Bathsheba have sex, and actually she gets pregnant, and then Uriah comes back, and then King David says, Well, he he can he sent when there's another battle, he sends Uriah up to the front lines, knowing that Uriah will be killed, and then David can have Bathsheba. Uh, a horrible thing to do, but you know, for, for a king and for King David uh, to do. Um, and that was why she called him a David. She didn't say, we, what she would is what we would have been, you know, maybe heard is you're a David, not David, but you're a David. Um, well, it, it begs the question at the end of the story, Anastasia, who is the crooked man? Um, mm. I, I wonder, does Doyle realize he's creating a story with that title in which you can ask the question at the end that it's actually not the Henry Wood is the, as the bent misshapen man is not the crooked man, the crooked man. Well, I actually, I, I don't know if crooked was used in that other sense back in the Victorian period. I, I feel like I would have to delve into a dictionary to, to double check. I'm pretty certain it was, and I can't, it'll be take me too much time to look it up, but I'm pretty certain it was. So crooked was already well. So I, it's, but it's, and it's certainly for, for us modern readers that can, that can lead to that question is who is the crooked man of the story? Well, of course it's Barkley. It's like, who's the monster in Frankenstein? Of course it's Victor, <laughs> not the creature. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and Barkley is the, the crooked man here. So, all righty. Well, that was fun. This was very fun. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Sherlockians, thank you for joining us for episode 24 of Sherlock Mondays. Anastasia, thank you. And you will return for episode 27, The Naval Treaty. Yes, I specifically asked for that one. I'm very excited to talk about it. And that one, that is on April 1st, is it not? I don't know, but it's at episode I, 27. I so. at that Whatever that date is, um, uh, it will. Um, and that's a story that features brain fever. So we'll get to that when, when we do it. So on our next show, episode 25, Monica Schmidt returns to talk about the resident patient in which a doctor asks for help when his own resident patient starts to behave very strangely. Thank you to our chat, Mrs. Hudson, Brianna, for managing the live chat links tonight. Thank you to the sponsor of Sherlock Mondays, Lisa Washington. We couldn't do these shows without the generous support of our patrons. You can support the Rosenbach through donation. Your support helps us create more programs like this and also care for our collections. You could also become a member. Membership gives you early access and discounts to programs and courses. And you can find out more about, at, about that at our website, rosenbach.org. And Registration for Sherlock Monday's The Hound of the Baskervilles is now open. I hope you will register for that show and continue the BiblioVenture through Sherlock Holmes stories by coming to those eight episodes of Hound of the Baskervilles. Again, let me remind you to subscribe to our channel, to like these videos. If you're listening to the podcast, leave us a review. Anastasia, so much fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. Awesome. All righty, everybody. Bye-bye. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library. Where the gape is a book. Whoops. That's a wrong share right there. Let's try this share again. <laughs> there we go. Here's the end credits. Bye-bye, everybody. Good night.